Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, General Physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. Whatever material I get from Google, YouTube, Slideshare.com and other literatures. All those things I am putting together in this different video lectures. Today we will be discussing on one of the another very interesting topic very frequently asked as a full question in your theory as well as in your oral exams and also you may be given a case the most common CNS case is hemiplegia. So we will be discussing on hemiplegia, etiology, definition, etiology, pathophysiology, how you examine the person, how you approach to a person. I will not be discussing in detail regarding the localization of lesion in case of a person who develops an hemiplegia then investigations and treatment part and later on complications. So hemiplegia is hemi means half, plagia means complete weakness of half of the body we call plagia and when you call paresis means it is a partial weakness. So when there is a complete weakness we use the word plagia and when we say paresis means it is partial weakness. So it is a paralysis of one side of the body due to pyramidal tract lesion at any point from its origin that is from cerebral cortex up to fifth cervical segment because upper limb is supplied from fifth cervical C5 level. So weakness of half of the body with or without involvement of the face that is cranial nerve will be labeled as hemi. And depending upon the type of weakness, if complete weakness, we call plagia. And if there is a partial weakness, we call paresis. Trunk does not can involve because trunk is having bilateral innervation. So in hemiplegia, it is upper limb and lower limb which is being involved with or without involvement of the face. That is labeled as hemiplegia. So, plagia means total paralysis, paresis means partial paralysis. So, it is severe or complete loss of motor function. It is more severe than hemiparesis and it is involving half of the body. It can be congenital or it can be acquired and among acquired the most common cause is stroke. So, paresis is incomplete loss of power. Stroke is damage to focal or global or we call generalized involvement of the nervous system due to vascular pathophysiology that is called stroke and being a vascular that is most common cause as far as hemiplegia or hemiparesis is concerned. So stroke is a syndrome of rapid onset of focal deficit or generalized deficit more than 24 hours leading to final it can lead to death while transient ischemic attack is usually full recovery within 24 hours and that is labeled as transient ischemic attack but now according to the newer definition absence of demonstration of infarct on a neuroradiology, you will call that as TIA. Progressive stroke and complete stroke. Progressive strokes means slowly the focal neurological deficit is increasing over a period of time. Also, it is labeled as stroke in evolution. The most classical example of stroke in evolution is a thrombotic stroke. While complete stroke, where at the onset, complete neurological deficit and then there is no further worsening with the time that is called complete stroke which is a classical example of embolic phenomena. 
So transient ischemic attack usually resolves within one hour without any demonstrable infarct on CT. Stroke will be having neurological symptoms and signs more than 24 hours. Stroke in evolution will be progressive. Completed stroke or we call acute stroke where neurological, focal neurological deficit persists but it does not progress. And there is a condition called reversible ischemic neurological deficit where focal brain ischemia in which the deficit improves over a period of time, maybe 72 hours and usually resolves completely. Two classical example, posterior reversible cardiovascular vasoconstriction syndrome. So cerebrovascular vasoconstriction syndrome or reversible posterior reversible cardiovascular syndrome. Two conditions RCVS and PRESS. Now as far as terminology is concerned depending upon the onset we call sudden onset or abrupt onset or we call slow or gradual. Slow or gradual are usually in a person who comes with thrombotic episodes while acute episodes are usually embolic or maybe subarachnoid hemorrhage or intra cerebral hemorrhage. Depending upon the site if there is a damage above C5 but below medulla we call spinal. If it is above brain stem right from cerebral cortex up to brain stem we call cerebral and if it is midbrain pons or medulla we call brain stem hemiplegia. So common we call spinal hemiplegia, cerebral hemiplegia or brain stem hemiplegia. During acute episode by and large invariably it is complete loss of tone we call flaccid hemiplegia and after recovery person invariably will have a increased tone in the muscle we call spastic hemiplegia and that depending upon the etiology cerebrovascular or vascular traumatic multiple sclerosis congenital acquired etc those terms are being utilized we already mentioned partial weakness paresis total weakness plagia etiology wise we already mentioned congenital and acquired there is some term in a congenital we call alternating hemiplegia, recurrent hemiplegia or familial hemiplegia. Now there are few terms which will be coming across in this particular hemiplegia chapter. So hemiplegia is half of the body but when you get only one limb say only one upper limb in, in, involved we will always use the word monoplegia and being supplied by the brachial plexus good number of time we use the word brachial monoplegia. And if the lower limb is involved, we call crural monoplegia. So these are the two common words which are being utilized. But similar words are also sometimes utilized in a person who gets a damage to corticospinal tract. And upper limb is mainly involved. But lower limb is not involved. Then they use the word brachial hemiplegia and crural is lower limb more involved, upper limb is spared that is called crural hemiplegia. Very odd conditions but once in a while that is seen particularly when anterior cerebral artery involves it will involve lower limb but sparing upper limb. So that can happen in anterior cerebral artery territory. While in a middle cerebral artery territory, you can get upper limb and face involved, but lower limb is spared. So that will be typical. And there is one called cruciate hemiplegia, where one side on the side of the damage, ipsilateral upper limb and contralateral lower limb involved, which is usually at the level of medulla. 
will be just uttering few of the words at present i am not going into any particular terminologies so we have already mentioned acute and chronic acute or sudden or we call abrupt classical example that is traumatic we call tbi traumatic brain injury vascular which will be embolic or intracranial hemorrhage by and large subarachnoid hemorrhage will not produce classical hemiplegia but intracranial hemorrhage in the region of internal capsule will produce hemiplegia bacterial and viral infection usually does not produce hemiplegia while chronic or slow or we call gradual will be seen in case of tumor as far as vascular etiology is concerned thrombosis and among other infection tuberculosis abscess parasitic infection fungal infection etc but of this the thrombosis will be very common which will be producing hemiplegia recurrent are more common with vascular occasional infection or maybe in tumor very very chronic by and large we call psychogenic or we call non organic there is one familial variety of hemiplegia where it is labeled as alternating hemiplegia now there are few words i am using here cross hemiplegia means when person is having hemiplegia on opposite side and lower motor neuron cranial lobe palsy on the side of the damage in a brain stem we call cross hemiplegia and when we say uncrossed hemiplegia meaning on the same side of hemiplegia you have got upper motor neuron involvement of facial and upper motor neuron involvement of hypoglossal particularly genioglossus muscle that we labeled as uncross or we call ipsilateral hemiplegia this is because of involvement of opposite side pyramidal tract right from cerebral cortex up to midbrain so that will be two common terms which we utilize i have already mentioned there is something called as a cruciate hemiplegia where upper limb is on the ipsilateral side and lower limb is on the contralateral side this will happen at the level of crossing of the pyramidal tract in medulla at the lower part of medulla means junction of upper and lower part at that level the pyramidal tract if it is damaged then you can have a cruciate variety we call cruciate hemiplegia where upper limb is on the same side and lower limb is on the opposite side we have already mentioned when you say hemiplegia means power is almost zero while in hemiparesis power is more than 1 but less than 5 there is one congenital variety where a person can present with multiple different varieties of motor involvement we call cerebral palsy which can be right from spastic monoparesis mono monoparesis hemiparesis paraparesis tetraparesis etc with other part of a cns also involved there is one term utilized is dan hemiplegia where upper limb and lower limb are equally involved and that is a classical example of internal capsular lesions when we get upper limb more involved as compared to lower limb very frequently the word utilized is brachial hemiplegia and when lower limb is more involved as compared to upper limb it is called crural hemiplegia and we have already mentioned crossed hemiplegia where ipsilateral lower motor cranial lobe palsy and opposite side you have got contralateral hemiplegia that is labeled as crossed hemiplegia these are all the different terms which are being utilized so try to remember some of these terms and if you find those type of findings you will be able to locate where is the lesion as far as etiology is concerned vascular etiology is the commonest of which we call occlusive or ischemic strokes are very common and among ischemic strokes again thrombosis is more common as compared to embolism so thrombosis is there which is the commonest cause is atherosclerosis blood disorders and embolic is second common which can come from heart we call cardioembolic very rarely from deep vein thrombosis and if a person has got 
patent foramen oval, you can have paradoxical embolization and that can. So this will be the two most common causes as far as vascular etiology is concerned. 15% of the people can have hemorrhagic stroke and among hemorrhagic stroke, it is very commonly secondary due to hypertension associated with rupture of intracranial aneurysm and the most common cause of intracranial aneurysm or AV malformations can be there. But among aneurysm, the aneurysm is very common at circle of willis at the base of the brain and that can lead to rupture. Those aneurysms are called berry aneurysms. So thromboembolic, most common. Hemorrhage is 15%. This is approximately 85%. Very rarely dissection of carotid artery or vertebral artery. Venous sinus thrombosis can also produce neurological weakness and not very common but may result into subdural or extradural bleeding. Can also involve pyramidal tract and produce hemiplegia. Depending upon the site, we call damage to the cerebral cortex, corona radiata, internal capsule, brain stem, that is midbrain pons and medulla. And then if there is a damage in the upper part of the cervical cord, above C5 level, you can develop hemiplegia. So ischemic stroke, 85% out of which 55% of the time thrombotic, embolic is 30%. Among embolic, artery to artery, commonest cause is atherosclerosis. In cardioembolic, atrial flutter fibrillation, ischemic heart disease and valvular heart disease. Among thrombotic, penetrating branch, lacunar infarcts, large vessels almost in 35% and lacunar infarct in 20%. Among hemorrhagic, subarachnoid hemorrhage usually will not result into classical hemipl hemiplegia, but intracerebral hemorrhage and occasionally subdural or extradural hematoma can end up with hemiplegia. So vascular becomes the most common etiology, rarely infective pathophysiology, neoplastic and demyelinating disease, particularly disseminated sclerosis or we call multiple sclerosis may involve internal capture. Traumatic very rarely can produce hemiplegia. Congenital cerebral palsy is quite common can lead to, and we have already mentioned, multiple sclerosis. Psychogenic is also labeled as parasomnia, parasomnia, or it is also labeled as nocturnal hemiplegia. So hemiplegia, infective, neoplastic, demyelination, that is disseminated sclerosis, traumatic, and congenital cerebral, that is cerebral palsy, are the common causes. Don't forget psychogenic. As far as thrombotic and embolic episode is concerned, the most common cause is atherosclerosis, where we get non-modifiable and modifiable risk factor. We have discussed enough time in cardiovascular system also, and you are also aware of it, non-modifiable age, gender, race, and hereditary, while in modifiable hypertension, diabetes, cigarette smoking, hyperlipidemia, thrombocythemia, polycythemia, obesity, oral contraceptive pills, physical inactivity, alcohol, peripheral vascular disease, etc. are the most common cause. Stroke is uncommon before 40 years except trauma, cardiovascular disease, congenital vascular abnormality, inflammatory arthritis, vascular disease and sickle cell. These are some of the common which can occur in an early age group or we call Younger, younger person. Recurrent hemiplegia is very common with metabolic disorders, prothrombotic conditions. Among metabolic disorders, homocystinuria. Then you can have hemiplegic migraine, moya moya disease, which is a vascular disorders. And there is one more variety called hemiplegia of childhood, alternating hemiplegia of childhood. These are rare conditions commonly seen in children. Alternating hemiplegia. And this is showing you abnormality in the brain development. Agyria, that is gyrus are almost nearly absent. And you can see here, 
Cisensophily means part of the brain is absent. This is normal. You can see sulci and gyri very clearly. Here, polymicrogyria. So, gyri and sulci are multiple, but they are shallow. So, this can also result into abnormality in the nervous system development. There is one condition called a Sturge Weber syndrome, where you get a cutaneous angiomas with a pot wine state. Person will have an epilepsy and 50% of the time, they will develop hemiplegia. This is quite common in children. You can see a pigmentation. This is cutaneous angiomas, pot wine stain, angioma with epilepsy. And they will have good number of time, 50% of the time, they will have hemiplegia. So do keep it in mind. As far as pathology is concerned, we know that in embolic, it is acute. Intracranial hemorrhage, it is acute. While in case of thrombosis, it is gradual. We already mentioned some of the common sites from where you get the thrombus formation. The thrombus formation is most common at the atherosclerotic site. And the commonest site being carotid artery. We call Carotid bifurcation, then even in MCA or ACA, occasionally you can come across <coughs> arterial dissections. Cardiac emboli is very common and that comes from acute MI, atrial flutter fibrillation from atrium, then rheumatic valvular heart disease. Also, you can have increased chance of thrombus formation in the thrombophilia, homocysteinuria. Sickle cell anemia can also give rise to occlusion of the vessels. SLE can produce vasculitis. These are all the different conditions which can give rise to vascular etiology. So, thrombus or embolus formation, hyperperfusion, ATP depletions, that is ischemia, because of ischemia, decreased energy production, failure of sodium potassium pump, and because of that failure, now membrane depolarization, cytotoxic cellular edema. Also, there will be vasogenic edema, calcium entry, sodium entry, glutamase release, and calcium entry, activation of the lipid peroxidase, protease, enzyme, etc. And there will be destruction of the intracellular structures like mitochondria, membrane, release of free radicals, etc. And there will be a death of a tissue that is neuronal cells and liquefaction and necrosis. And surrounding this necrotic area, there will be a central core and surrounding that necrotic core, you will have an area of ischemia we call zone of penubra, ischemic zone which is reversible still. Free fatty acid release and procoagulant activation will further take place. So, clinical symptoms and signs will depend upon the severity. So, it can be partial to total. Depends upon the acute phase or recovery phase. If it is in an acute phase, you will have a usually loss of tone. We call flaccid hemiplegia. And in a recovery phase, it will be always spastic variety. At the onset, it will be depending upon the type of onset in acute sudden onset, flaccid variety. In gradual onset, by the time you examine the person and person comes to you, good number of time already the spasticity has developed. Depending upon the involvement of the brain, brain stem or spinal cord, we label as cerebral hemiplegia, brain stem hemiplegia or spinal hemiplegia. We'll be mentioning those and depending upon the etiology, whether it is Infection, trauma, vascular, tumor, congenital or demyelinating disease. Some of the things which we will be discussing. It is one half of the body that is upper limb and lower limb involved. Maybe partial or complete. Complete we call plagia. Partial we call as or incomplete weakness. Partial weakness we call paresis. And when there is a damage at the brainstem level, you will have always crossed hemiplegia, means on the side of the damage. Say if there is a damage to the right side in the brain stem, 
on that side you will have depending upon the midbrain pons or medulla you will have a lower motor neuron cranial nerve palsy whichever motor cranial nerve is involved and opposite side upper limb and lower limb will be involved we call that as a crossed hemiplegia well if there is a damage to cerebral cortex up to midbrain then you will have opposite side hemiplegia opposite side upper motor neuron facial and opposite side 12th cranial nerve genioglossus being involved so this will be a typical presentation which will be in general in short i have already explained this particular slide previously and we will have two type of presentation we call transient or complete stroke in transient you will get weakness but it a person will recover within few seconds to minutes very rarely more than one hour but there will be no residual neurological deficit while in a person who has developed a stroke he will always have a permanent residual damage so that will be difference between transient ischemic attack and a stroke and i have already explained all the terminology including cross uncross cruciate that cerebral palsy brachial hemiplegia crural hemiplegia and cross hemiplegia all this i have explained dense hemiplegia all those words i have explained tia also i have explained complete strokes i have explained then reversible ischemic neurological damage stroke in evolution all these words we have explained so symptoms and signs will be depending upon the area which is being involved onset how it progresses whether progressive non progressive acute or chronic whether cerebral spinal or brain stem and at the initial stage because of weakness person will find difficulty in walking he will have also imbalance and he will have motor activity will be affected of upper limb or lower limb or both will be affected partial or complete and when he recovers there will be increased tone in the muscle and person because of involvement of the facial muscle and genioglossus person will also have difficulty in speech we call as a dysarthria these are the common finding and if the brain stem is involved then you can have involvement of the glossopharyngeal vagus etc which will produce difficulty in swallowing we call dysphagia and because of involvement of the facial person will have a drooping of the angle of the mouth on the side of damage that is as far as the corticospinal tract is concerned it is opposite side but on the side of hemiplegia you will have a drooping of the angle of the mouth nasolabial fold will not be seen person will have ability to elevate the eyebrow close the eye and there will be furrowing of the forehead that will be clearly seen if person has got damage in the medulla because of damage to the reticular formation person will have altered level of consciousness also person will have altered level of consciousness if there is a gross damage to the cerebral cortex also so these are some of the findings which you will be coming across along with that so in a thrombotic episode it is usually during sleep or early morning on rising very common in elderly person there is a step wise evolution means there is a gradual increase in weakness person is usually fully conscious and person will have a gradual recovery if treated early there will be no seizures and no headache because there is no raised intracranial pressure by and large there will be no prodromal tis because this is a thrombotic episodes and there will be clear cut evidence of atherosclerosis either in a carotid artery circulation or vertebro basilar artery circulations while embolic will be abrupt onset at the onset only person will have a complete stroke within few seconds to minutes rapid improvement within minutes or hours will occur at any time very frequently during activity 
there is relative preservation of consciousness because usually there is a small area of involvement can occur at any age because there are a lot of causes of embolic stroke even in a younger individual may develop seizures there is a rapid recovery may have a localized headache there may be evidence of recent strokes there will be no history of prodromal ti in hemorrhagic strokes hypertension will be most common finding it is usually during working hours person will always have a severe headache seizures will be very common headache vomiting blood vision will be very common with symptom signs of raised intracranial pressure will be very common almost always there will be altered level of consciousness rapidly deteriorating person will have a neck rigidity and in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage and intra ventricular hemorrhage good number of time person will have a neck rigidity along with brusgenke sign and kernick sign the recovery is usually not good may be delayed if there is some surgical intervention or procedure is being done by and large no recovery absence of prodromal symptoms and rapid deterioration is very very common difference between ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke loss of consciousness is more with hemorrhagic stroke headache is more common with hemorrhagic stroke vomiting is more common with hemorrhagic stroke previous tia will be more common in ischemia gradual onset will be in ischemic stroke while rapidly progressive will be in case of hemorrhagic stroke relation with activity ischemic stroke is very commonly following a early morning or during sleep while this is during activity blood pressure is usually high in case of hemorrhagic strokes while it is by and large normal in case of an ischemic stroke csf will show you the presence of blood and xanthochromia in hemorrhagic while in case of severe infarct in ischemic stroke you might see little amount of xanthochromia and occasionally rbc associated features like headache vomiting altered level of consciousness seizures etc are much more common in hemorrhagic stroke and particularly if the person has got involvement of cerebral cortex person will have a seizures quite common altered level of consciousness and in case of a medullary involvement medulla involvement person will also have a altered level of consciousness with other cranial nerves involvement cerebellar signs will be very commonly present if the person has got pons and medulla being involved where person will have ataxia wide base gait scanning speech nystagmus hypotonia pendular nigia or didacokinesia or dysdidacokinesia dysmetria intense nerve tremor and other cerebellar signs very early recognition of hemiplegia is very easy we call fast or that is face drooping of the face absence of angle of mouth and person will have absence of furrowing inability abs are sorry person will have furrowing presence it will be upper motor neuron involvement upper motor neuron involvement so that will be typical face involvement weakness in the arms and legs speech disturbances because of facial muscle involvement as well as the hypoglossal involvement and time is very important also some people mention t as a terrible headache particularly in a subarachnoid hemorrhage we call thunder clap headache they utilize also two other symptoms that is balance and eye involvement if a person has got sudden loss of balance maybe because of a brain stem involvement particularly vestibular or cerebellar involvement because of vb territory and also visual disturbances particularly in the form of homonymous hemianopia or amurosis fugax will be very common in vertebro basilar artery territory and face arm and speech we have already mentioned and terrible headache in case of thunderclap headache particularly in subarachnoid hemorrhage we already mentioned two classical stages 
that is in acute lesion stage of flaccidity in initial phase which may last for 2 to 6 weeks but good number of time persons as it starts recovering the tone will appear and then person will have a spastic gait so spasticity and that increased tone will be in a anti gravity muscle affects pro gravity more than anti gravity muscle sorry pro gravity muscles that is spasticity will be more in case of a flexor and adductors in upper limb while extensor and adductor in lower limb so that will be very very typical while initial during acute damage person will have a loss of tone and absence of deep tendon reflex and plantar reflex will be extensor in case of a gradual lesion by and large the person will present with spastic lesions so we call spastic paraplegia so acute lesion will be flaccid recovery stage spastic so flaccid may remain for 2 to 6 weeks while spastic will have a hypertonia exaggerated deep tendon reflex loss of superficial reflex particularly abdominal cremastic as well as even we call anal reflex will be also nearly absent while plantar reflex will be extensor and there will be typical circumduction gait or we call spastic hemiplegic gait to roughly we will go through we have got three type of main sites cerebral brain stem and spinal cord i'll be not be going into detail in cerebral cortex usually depending upon the site of the damage if it is close to the midline lower limb will be more involved if it is close to the lateral sulcus upper limb and the face will be more involved this is a middle cerebral artery territory this is anterior cerebral artery territory so you will always have a sparing effect in case of a cerebral if it is mca it is lower limb sorry mca it is face and arm aca is lower limb while in the brain stem it will be a contralateral hemiplegia on the side of the damage lower motor neuron cranial nerve palsy and opposite side hemiplegia while in case of a spinal on the side of the damage on the same side of the damage wherever there is a damage on that side if it is above c5 then you will have upper limb and lower limb involved with definite sensory level so if you come across on the side of the damage lower half of the face with upper limb and lower limb involved it will be uncrossed hemiplegia usually it will be on a contralateral side if there is a damage above above mid brain while in case of a spinal below the level of damage you will have the same side and it will be upper motor neuron and at the level of the damage you will have a lower motor neuron findings that will be in case of a spinal and in spinal there will be no cranial nerve involvement while in a brain stem at the site of the damage in mid brain third and fourth in pons 5 6 7 8 and in medulla 9 10 11 and 12 cranial nerve will be involved i am not going into detail when you get this type of lesion this will be we call brain stem lesion on the side of the damage lower motor neuron facial and opposite side upper limb and lower limb this damage has to be in a lower part of the pons where facial nerve will be involved as a lower motor neuron and opposite side you will have a contralateral hemiplegia and that will be very very typical so do a cranial nerve examination if no cranial nerve in, is involved the lesion is below the medulla or above c5 so between these two very typical immediately you can differentiate if cranial nerve is involved other than facial lesion has to be in the brain stem if facial nerve is involved and if it is upper motor neuron lesion has to be above brain stem and if it is lower motor neuron the lesion has to be at the level of pons 
very very simple in lower motor neuron complete half of the face on the same side in upper motor neuron lower half of the face on opposite side so that we have already explained spinal cord same side no cranial lobe palsy brain stem contralateral hemiplegia lower motor neuron cranial lobe palsy on the side of the damage in cerebral opposite side with upper motor neuron lower half of the face on the side of hemiplegia and upper motor neuron 12th cranial lobe particularly genioglossus of opposite side with homonymous hemianopia if there is a damage in internal capsule these are the artery involved vertebral artery inter internal carotid artery in again internal carotid artery depending upon the artery which part is being involved that is being mentioned here at your leisure time you can go through this is an arterial supply to differentiate congenital and acquired you must look difference between congenital and acquired in congenital abdominal reflex is retained while in acquired it is lost cortical sensory loss will be more common with congenital while it is less common in acquired group homonymous hemianopia will be again very common in congenital vasomotor changes will be also common in congenital involuntary movement is less common in congenital while in acquired you can come across with a basal ganglia damage epilepsy will be more common with acquired group dysphagia will be also more common with acquired group this is a little difference between congenital and acquired hemiplegia so indirectly whenever you want to examine for hemiplegia you should look for face arm and speech so you look at the fish arm and speech you will be able to almost make out that person has got hemiplegia or not if face is involved and it is lower half of the face then straight forward you will go listen about the brain stem cranial nerve involved yes or no if no cranial nerve involved then listen has to be below medulla above c5 if cranial nerve is involved then look at what type of cranial nerve involvement if it is on the side of the hemiplegia it is above the mid brain if it is contralateral it is at the level of damage you will have a lower motor neuron cranial nerve with opposite side hemiplegia roughly this is a very simple way to identify and then if you want to further differentiate you will have to go through hemiplegia diagnosis by brain stem that is pons medulla and mid brain level so brain stem syndromes i'll be uploading that separately so if you come across a contralateral hemiplegia it will be in internal capsule or above the mid brain and brain stem lesion will produce contralateral hemiplegia this is all on the same side tongue body and face on the same side contralateral while this is contralateral brain stem means face involved on one side that is lower motor neuron face and opposite side hemiplegia if there is a sensory involvement you will have to go through which tracks are being involved and accordingly if person is having nystagmus it will be the pons or medulla coordination involved again pons or medulla that will be there if it is a hemiplegia in young it may be trauma atrial flutter fibrillation multiple sclerosis vasculitis drug abuse particularly like cocaine or bleeding disorders this will be the common pattern you can utilize so in a cortical lesion contralateral hemiplegia cortical sensory loss will be there particularly in cortical sensory loss you can have stereognosis being affected then localization two point discrimination discrimination 
then graphesthesia, all this cortical sensation will be affected. Person can have altered level of consciousness and convulsions may be also commonly seen. And depending upon which lobe is being involved, which territory, particularly if the parietal lobe is involved, you can have agnosia, apraxia, etc. And in a case of a frontal lobe, you can have aphasia. And if it is a dominant aphasia, dominant hemisphere, Broca's aphasia. And if it is a parietal lobe, you can have Wernicke's aphasia. And if both lobes are involved, frontal as well as parietal lobe, you can have a global aphasia. So this will be all the different things you can come across. And depending upon the type of involvement, whether it is thrombosis or hemorrhage, if there is a raised intracranial pressure, you can have headache, vomiting, altered level of consciousness, blurred vision, those findings can be there. If there is a dominant hemisphere and particularly parietal lobe, you can have adjustment syndrome in the form of agraphia, agraphia, finger agnosia and inability to distinguish right and left. Alexia can be also seen, tactile agnosia and person will have body case aphasia. If there is an internal capsular level, you will have a dense hemiplegia means upper limb is equally involved as a lower limb. No speech difficulty, particularly aphasia. But because of the face involvement simultaneously, person can have a dysarthria. No convulsions. You will have upper motor neuron facial and hypoglossal being involved. That is genioglossus. In subcortical, there is always a sparing effect because corona radiata is a spread out fibers. <coughs> so, sorry. So, you will have a sparing effect. So, you can one part of the body being more involved as compared to the other. So, in a corona radiata, fibers are close together, although the weakness is more marked in one limb as compared to other limb because they are converging at internal capsule and we already mentioned in internal capsule you will have a dense hemiplegia no aphasia but person can have dysarthria no convulsions and he will have upper motor neuron facial and upper motor neuron genioclossus involvement with involvement of a thalamocortical fiber that will give rise to hemisensory loss that is hemi anesthesia and optic radiation being involved, homonymous hemianopia on opposite side. So, homonymous hemianopia. So, if there is a right side internal capsule damage, it will be left side homonymous hemianopia. And internal capsule, major part is supplied by MCA territory branch. Some portion is supplied by posterior cerebral artery and some portion is by anterior cerebral artery. But the major is by middle cerebral artery. So, you will have a dense hemiplegia. This is a dense hemiplegia, homonymous hemianopia, upper motor neuron facial, and genioclossus with plantar extensor. And in a recovery phase, person will have typical circumduction hemiplegic gait. I am not going into detail regarding upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron pulsing, just going fast. Hypertonia, hypotonia. Superficial reflex in upper motor neuron will be absent, while here both deep tendon reflex and superficial reflex both will be absent at the level of damage. Deep reflexes will be brisk, plantar reflex will be extensor, while here plantar will be flexor. And if there is a damage at the level of alpha S1, plantar reflex will be absent. Wasting will be very minimum and late, while here wasting will be early and atrophy will be there. And in that muscle, atrophic muscle, you will see fasciculation. While a group of muscles are being involved, here you will have individual muscles or one group may be involved. Two or three muscles may be involved. Sensory loss, very frequently it will be on the same side of the hemiplegic side, we call as a hemianesthesia. You will have a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. I've already explained. So, if you get the damage on, say, right side, 
say this is right side of the person, then he will have a left side homonymous hemianopia. Even acuity will be affected in person who has got damage to the cerebral cortex. In case of a spinal hemiplegia, I have already mentioned, no cranial nerve involvement and face is totally spared. We are not going into detail regarding how exactly you make out that hemiplegia. It is a typical we will be describing in a brown sequard syndrome. I will be discussing in that particular chapter. So, hemiplegia can be involvement of the motor system, coordination, sensory, cranial nerves, even eye, speech, etc. can be involved. And a person who has got a hemiplegia will be having upper motor neuron, will have a pronator drip, cross hemiplegia will be there if the person has got damage in the brain stem. Uncross hemiplegia will be seen if a person has got lower motor, upper motor neuron facial and upper motor neuron hypoglossum on opposite side. Speech will be disturbed because of dysphasia. If motor area is involved, you will get Broca's aphasia or we call non-fluent or expressive aphasia. And if you have got parietal lobe involved, you will have a Wernicke's aphasia or fluent aphasia or receptive or sensory aphasia and in a recovery phase person will have a typical circumduction gait or we call hemiplegic spastic gait. This is that typical involvement in cortical you will have a coma, aphasia, convulsions. Very frequently it will be one limb more involved as compared to other limb. Hemisensory loss will be there along with hemiplegia in case of a internal capsular damage. Cranial nerve will be affected, particularly above the midbrain. You will have a lower half of the face and tongue involved on the side of hemiplegia. While in a midbrain pons and medulla, it will be always opposite side of the body. And tongue and face will be always on the side of the damage. So you will get cross hemiplegia in case of a person who develops a damage in a brain stem that is in a brain stem there will be contralateral hemiplegia with same side lower motor neuron facial and internal capsule it will be opposite side hemiplegia if the person has got uncross hemiplegia meaning on the side of the hemiplegic side if you have got 7th and 12th we label that as uncrossed and also in case of spinal we label that as uncrossed but in that we don't have involvement of cranial nose. So in cortical it is coma, aphasia, convulsions. In capsular, hemisensory loss, 7th and 12th involved on the same side of hemiplegia. Brainstem, opposite side weakness with cranial and 12th cranial nerve involvement, we call cross hemiplegia. And in the spinal cord, classical brown sequard syndrome, you will have a dissociate sensory loss. We will not be discussing at present. So, Check for sensory loss to find out the level you will have to look for motor and sensory and sensory level will help you to identify in case of a spinal cord damage and if you look for the cranial nerves it will help you to identify brainstem damage or above brainstem. There will be two varieties organic and psychogenic variety of hemiplegia. Organic means there is a damage to the neuronal systems. It is half of the body while in a psychogenic face will not be involved, tongue will not be involved, sternomastoid will not be involved. Deep tendon reflex will be exaggerated in a recovery phase of organic variety while 
in psychogenic they will be totally normal in organic abdominal reflex will be absent while in psychogenic abdominal reflex will be normal babinski means plantar will be extensor in organic while psychogenic plantar reflex will be flexor or mainly may be withdrawn in organic because the tone is increased the reflexes will be brisk while in psychogenic person will have a variable tone usually person will not allow you to examine the tone in organic variety typical circumduction gait while there will be a bizarre gait in case of psychogenic hoover sign will be present in case of organic while hoover signs will be abnormal in psychogenic it is very very useful sign i'll be uploading a video showing you a very nice way of hoover sign hemi anesthesia will be very common if in a organic you get the damage in the internal capsule while in case of psychogenic there will be abnormal finding in sensory system where it will be bizarre loss of sensation that is in children you can come across abs palsy in hemiplegia elbow will be flexed while in case of abs palsy shoulder will be adducted internally rotated elbow will be extended wrist will be flexed and finger will be flexed typical posture typical posture reflexes bicep supinator will be absent tricep will be present while in hemiplegic means we call uh, congenital hemiplegia will have a dip tendon reflex will be brisk tone will be hypotonic in case of abs palsy while in case of hemiplegia it will be hypertonia grass will be normal in abs while in case of hemiplegia it will be weak this will be a simple difference to differentiate between abs and hemiplegia investigations very commonly we always go for cerebrovascular that is plain ct and then if required ct angio or mri angio csf examination for presence of blood and xanthochromia mainly to rule out hemorrhagic stroke echo encephalography will be very useful in case of a hemorrhagic stroke as well as in case of traumatic injury and then risk factor evaluation is a must because the common cause is hypertension and atherosclerosis so radiological investigations like plain ct in a this is ischemic so that becomes very very sensitive ischemic stroke identification will be very very sensitive you can see here there is a big area of edema so hemorrhagic strokes will be also very helpful ct scan without contrast will be almost 90% sensitive and specific will be 100% so always go for ct is always better without contrast in initial stage to identify early ischemia ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke so stroke identification will be very easy by ct without contrast treatment part wise it will depend upon the basic etiology like thrombosis embolism or hemorrhage or traumatic injury and when the person recovers physiotherapy occupational therapy and speech therapy will be required for secondary prevention control of risk factors rigid control of diabetes hypertension hyperlipidemia as well as statins aspirin etc and sometimes person may require even anticoagulants particularly in case of embolic phenomena occasionally person may require a surgical intervention particularly in case of a intracranial hemorrhage or traumatic or in case of tumors etc there are a lot of research which are being there as far as stem cell transplant or neuronal transplant but yet not successful 
so pharmacological treatment surgical treatment rehabilitations and you have got different assessment tools main aim should be to minimize the brain damage reduce disability through rehabilitation prevent complications treat the underlying cause treat the to prevent the recurrence of the stroke by giving a secondary prevention if person has developed subarachnoid hemorrhage person should be referred to neurosurgical department tia should be treated as an acute emergency and if person is having vital data being affected person should be hospitalized and at supportive treatment should be given along with this above treatment like airway breathing and circulation fluid balance nutrition by either nasogastric feeding or by iv fluids catheter physiotherapy then followed by occupational and speech therapy and also some person may require a psychotherapy in general any person who is a bedridden person care of skin care of respiration nutrition food fluid balance electrolyte balance urinary bladder care bladder care urinary care bowel care etc care of eye all those should be done so in general care should be taken care care of nutrition bladder prevention of dvt then treatment of specific condition like thrombosis antiplatelet drugs statins control of hypertension diabetes dyslipidemia we have already mentioned all those things then in embolism treatment of the source of embolism anticoagulation will be required in a person who gets cardioembolic phenomena control of vascular risk factor and sometime you might require a surgical evacuation particularly in case of intracranial hemorrhage in case of meningitis and encephalitis treatment according to the disorders brain tumor surgical removal in case of multiple sclerosis person may require steroids so anti hypertensive anti platelet anticoagulant thrombolysis will be required in case of ischemic stroke and in a raised intracranial pressure manitol you might require to use baclofen for reducing spasticity in a recovery phase surgical intervention in a secondary prevention can be carotid and atrectomy or evacuation of hematoma in case of a intracranial hemorrhage physiotherapy particularly physiotherapy occupational therapy and speech therapy is a must secondary prevention is control of cardiovascular risk factor control of hypertension control of diabetes if person is having atrial fibrillation treatment of atrial fibrillation etc primary prevention is again before the person gets a stroke control of hypertension diabetes stop smoking lipid control treatment of atrial flutter fibrillation by anticoagulation and treatment of atrial fibrillation by antiarrhythmic drugs treatment in case of polycythemia rubra vera sickle cell etc should be done and if a person is having narrowing of the carotid artery atherectomy and arterectomy etc should be also done in rehabilitation again physiotherapy occupational therapy and speech therapy is very important as far as complication is concerned permanent residual weakness disuse atrophy stiffness we call spasticity and person can develop even ankylosing at the bone psychological disorders in the form of depression is very common other complication during acute stroke pneumonia hyponatremia hypoglycemia seizures frozen shoulder uti dehydration hypoxia dvt then subluxation of joints pressure sores constipations all those are some of the complications so i end this lecture i feel this will be very helpful to you in your theory as well as it will be very helpful to you in your oral exams 
and in your oral exams good number of time of case of hemiplegia is kept so you must know at least good number of thing from this lecture if you like this particular lecture don't forget to press button like subscribe and please press bell icon if you feel this is helpful to your friends you can share with your friends thank you all for taking out time i know that your time is valuable and i appreciate you for spending some of the time with me see you in next lecture i will be also uploading one lecture on localization of lesion in hemiplegia and motor system examination so you can go through if you are interested to localize those particular lesions at brain stem level at cortical level etc little bit in more detail here i have just gone superficial so see you in those lectures